I'm here with Father Maudsley, and he is he has recently published a book called If You Believed Moses, and this is volume one. You can see it right here, and it is about the conversion prophesied of the Jews in the Old Testament. Father, why did you write the book, and um, to what end? It, it's actually connected with the um, closure of the churches for a couple of years uh, under the COVID regime, and then Traditionus Custodus, the church abandoning her tradition. And this is trying to get what's, what is behind that. Um, and the volume two will deal with why they're all connected. But it's such a contentious subject. I think, first of all, I want to put out volume one to help Catholics see that the conversion of the Jews at the end of the age is something real. It certainly will happen. We can have faith in it and we can have a joyful hope in it because it's going to be this immense good and um, incredible. Like, you know what, if you want a movie to have a good ending. Well, God has written history. It is going to have the most fantastic surprise ending. We know some outlines, but we don't know how this will come about. And it will help fill us with charity because perfect love casts out fear. If you're afraid, you hate. Mm -hmm. But if you're not afraid, there's no, no place for hate. So we, we can desire their conversion and pray for it. And if there's a um, misunderstanding or worse, and um, then we, we can bear that. We can, we can bear the, the troubles that we'll get for talking about this. Right. And yeah, let's address that quick, too, because um, this question, the Jewish question, I know that means something different when Hilaire Belloc uses that in a, in, a, in a technical sense. But this whole question of talking about Judaism, the Jews converting to Christianity, Israel and so forth, this is very contentious for a lot of people. And um, I want to say my little spiel about how I think there are a good there's a good way to talk about it. There's actually kind of two pitfalls, and I think there's sort of a via media. Um, and then perhaps you can comment as well. So on the one hand, and I mentioned this briefly in our last video, which if you haven't watched that, ladies and gentlemen, it was called Resist Until It Hurts, I think is what it's called. Uh, a wonderful interview from about three months ago. And um, on the one hand, there's this, been this influence of, well, very much a, a, a Noah Hyde Judeo post-Temple Judaism principle that we'll get into, uh, where it's basically... Israel is a shining city on the hill. This is very common amongst evangelicals and you know, conservative Catholics. Um, you know, you need to support because because Jews are in the Bible, Christians need to support them with all their heart, all their mind and all their soul. This leads to supporting a lot of the policies of Israel, which have just been objectively speaking from a geopolitical perspective, pretty bad. Um, you know, I don't care if it's a Muslim, Jewish or Christian country acting the way they've acted has just been wrong in so many cases. Um, on the other hand, there's another pitfall that people fall into where if we could call that sort of like Jewish exceptionalism, almost like American exceptionalism, on the other hand, you fall into this genetic fallacy. I mean, it really is a basic philosophical fallacy where you can't distinguish, you know, uh, persons from policy. You can't distinguish the individual from the group. And I don't care what kind of group you're talking about. If you do that, this is a literal fallacy philosophically. You, you apply immutable characteristics to an individual because of blood relation, whether it's skin color, whether it's place of birth, whatever it is, it doesn't make any sense because all human beings have free will. And that stops you from being able to address the person and Christ always addressed individual persons and he spoke to them, having the image of God in their souls. All people have this uh, made in the image of God. And if you follow those two extremes, on the one hand, you get the very bitter, hateful, resentful. I hate the term racist because everything is racist nowadays, but let's just use that for lack of a better term. Let's say, you know, bigoted, if that makes sense. On the other hand, you fall into an unrealistic position on the other side. Is that, would you maybe say that's a, a good way of framing it? Yes. And the um, looking to the Bible, in fact, gives us a, a perfect formula to understand this. It's that there's a mortal enmity from the elder brother to the younger brother who represent Judaism, Christianity. And some people want to, by a defect, they say, there is no enmity, we're all brothers. And you end up with the universal fraternity of Francis, which is a disaster and a lack of charity leads to hell. 
the other fault is to say there's such an enmity that there can't be brotherhood because mm-hmm. we're thinking in a way. So you hear people say the Jews are the synagogue of Satan. That's it. Full stop. They can't possibly convert. They can't be saved. Write them off and we should hate them. That's that's also against Christ and what he showed us on right. the cross. The fact is that, that the New Testament gives us a key to unlock the Torah and the Old Testament. And so we can understand, for example, St. Paul, well, it begins with Jesus talking about, for example, the two brothers and the prodigal son. And then the church fathers finding multiple instances in the life of Christ and his miracles and his teachings that of the final conversion of the Jews, which I, I write about in the book. Then we have St. Paul look at Ishmael and Isaac. They represent the synagogue and the church as the children of Hagar and Sarah, the earthly Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, the slave woman, the bond woman, and the free woman, the one who were conceived carnally in the flesh and the other Isaac by a promise of God, a miraculous conception. So Ishmael and Isaac are kind of key here. And then he, St. Paul uh, tells us more about Jacob and Esau, that the elder persecuted the younger. He said the carnal persecutes the spiritual, and so it is now. The church fathers tell us that Cain and Abel represent the, the Jews and Christ. And also that Joseph and his brothers is a picture of the Jews and Christ. And again, that Joseph went through all that suffering, which he saw as providential. He accepted as Christ took his passion, although it took Joseph probably longer to figure out what was happening. But when his brothers were terrified at the end that he was going to have bad memories and be angry, he spoke to them mildly. He was weeping and embracing them, kissing them, and then showered Benjamin who is the last generation of Israel, by the way. His father, Jacob, is called Israel. Benjamin's the last son. He's the last generation of Israel. And Joseph gave him five festal garments and 300 pieces of silver, I think, and a five-fold um, serving at the banquet, which is a, a picture of holy mass. Hmm. There's so many clues in the Bible. So we have Joseph who was willing to suffer in order, he said, to feed the world, save the world, and to save his brothers. He... God protected Ishmael when he was cast out in the desert, right? God protected Ishmael. God protected Cain. He said he's put a mark on Cain. And whoever, bless Cain, come back sevenfold on them. He protected Esau in that he said to the Israelites after, you shall not have a foot of land in Edom. Do not go to war against your brothers and say because he's given that land to them. God protected Joseph's brothers through Joseph and supplied for them. So we've seen actually the church through history has supplied for Jews and protected them, although we hear a very different history from falsified history. Yes. Yeah. So all the time you have this divine protection of the Jews, which means the church has understood this in her laws, that she may not harm the Jews, but um, she has to recognize that their denial of Christ being the Son of God and the Messiah is the most spiritually dangerous thing on this planet. Mm. However, at the end, we have this faith in their conversion, which we see in a sense in Moses and Aaron. Should I continue or? Uh, yeah, let's let's hold that for a sec because we don't want to give away the whole book in the first 10 minutes. Um, and uh, there's two things I really wanted to go into here. Um, the first one, is Jacob and Esau. So I was reading your book last night. Everyone knows I'm kind of a night owl. It was, you know, midnight or one in the morning and I'm sitting here reading this book. So I'm, I've never heard this until I read your book. So Jacob and Esau, um, this is with this, if I'm not, I'm not getting the brothers mixed up. This is where, um, uh, the one comes out hairy and red and okay. Okay. And then when they, the way they describe the brothers, Cause that's such a strange detail. He was covered in hair and red. It's like, what, what does that even mean? He's a little gremlin or something. Like you don't even know what it means. And then, but then you explained how they would describe Esau as being this manly hunter. You know, he seems like the good guy. And then the way it's translated, oh, and Jacob just dwelled in tents. It's like, sounds like he lays around, but actually 
it's a religious thing. It means he is in the temple all the time. It's prefiguring the fact that he's in the tabernacle all the time. Could you break down that Jacob and Esau thing? Because I found that so fascinating. Yes, St. Louis Marie de Montfort, quoting the father, says that uh, Jacob being a man who dwelt in tents means he's close to his mother, Rebecca, meaning Mary, and he's a man of contemplation and prayer. The word the Vulgate uses is simplex, he's simple. The Greek word, um, it, it translates as formless even, not just simple, but formless in a way that God is formless without form because he transcends all form. It's an amazing word. And the Hebrew word indicates someone who is in, in, integral, uh, decent, honest. So th this is Jacob. Now Esau is the hunter um, using the word the first time, I think, in Genesis since, since we heard of Nimrod, who is a, a type yeah. of the Antichrist who, who hunts men. Um, and Esau is carnal so that when he lost his birthright to Jacob, which signifies the covenant going, the old covenant ending and the new covenant beginning, and Christ is the one who inherits it and every Christian in him. Esau didn't even care after he had lost it because he had a full stomach. He said he, he walked away despising his birthright because he just wanted a full stomach, which means the things of this world. Um, I, I got that detail from the rabbis, from listening to the rabbis, that they see that Esau had, didn't have the spiritual priorities. But of course, the rabbis don't understand how it's fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Hmm. Okay, yeah, that's really fascinating. And then there's another aspect. Is this with I is is this with Isaac and Ishmael, the word play? Is that where that is? Yeah. Can you break yeah. that down? Because I know that you also see this word. I uh, there was a great sermon I listened to years ago about the golden calf of evolution by a patrician priest from the United States, and he showed how when the Israelites rose up to play, it actually refers to something like a ritual sexualism or something, uh, some sort of debauchery. And so you're so this word is in there in the story of Isaac and Ishmael. Could you please explain that to us? So th the word play, when um, Abraham and Sarah were told that, that it was announced to them that they would this time next year you'll have a son, uh, they both laughed. I think Abraham had his face to the floor and laughed, and Sarah was behind the door and laughed, and God said you laughed, and she said I didn't laugh, and he said you did laugh, um, and they call their son Isaac, which means laughter which is so fitting and we might think it's that Sarah didn't believe the announcement and that's why she laughed thinking shall a woman of my age have pleasure which is the word for Eden by the way it's about restoring Eden. Mm. but in Mary we see it um, exalted to be this heavenly joy at the Annunciation but this word play which is the same root as the name of Isaac is that when he was the boy was weaned he, 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 could have been quite a bit older than we think of when a child is weaned. We're not talking about a two or three year old here. It could be to do with the 13 years old or 12 years old. Right. So Sarah saw Ishmael or the son of Hagar playing with her son and that the Vulgate and Septuagint add Isaac. And so you have this play on the word playing. And then Sarah says, cast, cast him out. The son of the bond woman will not inherit with the son of the promise. And we're supposed to think that that's a bit of an overreaction from Sarah, casting a boy out because she was playing with her son. But it's, it's not an overreaction. She represents Holy Mother Church protecting her children from sexual abuse, which the church has not been doing for the last decades. Because that word, because that word play is usually no. used in reference to sexual abuse or weirdness. The first time Genesis is in the context of Sodom and Gomorrah. It's a bit ominous. Then we have it with Jacob and Isaac and Rebecca, but it's in a positive sense of Isaac caressing Rebecca, but it is a sexual sense. Right. Then we have this Ishmael and Isaac. Sorry, I must have the timing wrong there. But um, it's also used for Potiphar's wife accusing Joseph of sexual play, as, as unwanted sexual attention. And it's the word, as, as you said, in Exodus after the golden calf, that they sat down to eat and rose to play, which is fornication, basically. Mm -hmm. And it's also the word used for when Samson was tortured, and it says they made sport of him. God knows yeah. what they yeah. attempted to do. But it has these multiple other instances where it's used in a sexually perverse or even idolatrous way. 
And we can see how much sexual perversion is tied up with idolatry and Satanism. Very, very close. That's what Sarah was protecting her son Isaac from, from Ishmael. And we see today how pornography is an industrial scale weapon used against populations to turn them into morons. Um, and that's what the church should be protecting the, the faithful from and indeed the world. Okay, so my wheels are spinning here because I'm looking at my notes and we're going to talk about how this idea of basically all good people go to heaven, the dual covenant, universal brotherhood um, versus true brotherhood. These are errors that are even in Orthodox Judaism, Judge, and you show that in your book. Those errors are rampant in the church. I mean, this is, you know, fratelli tutti, tutti frutti, right? Like, you know, we're all brothers and the Abrahamic house and all this. I mean, even just the idea of calling it an Abrahamic house, you know, uh, all these ideas. So on the one hand, this basically ecumenism is what that is. You know, uh, we, as you'll explain to us in a bit, Orthodox Jews are ecumenists. And this is why I'm going to call this episode something like Ben Shapiro needs to see this. He said something like... Uh, you know, basically Judaism is all good because we have our covenant and then we believe in this Noahide covenant, which you'll explain in a bit, which basically means as long as you do a good thing, you can be saved. I was like, okay, well, that's basically universalism in some, some capacity. But as we have those errors in the church, we also have the error of play in the church. Those two things, meaning, meaning as the church has embraced these basically post, post-temple rabbinic errors, in the theological and in, in, in the in the well, we have a Jewish table blessing in the Novus Ordo for the offertory. Um, as we've embraced these things, we have also seen the errors of the older brother that we see in Scripture. Is there something there? Am I on the right track? Absolutely, because Sarah sent Ishmael away to protect Isaac, and in the next generation, Rebecca actually sent Jacob away who represents Christ, from Esau, who wanted to murder him. So you have this twofold care of the mothers. By the way, the, the half, first half of this book is all about brothers in the Torah, but it finishes with the chapter about the mothers. It's the mothers representing Mary who actually work out the reconciliation. Um, but that's a, another subject. The I think we can see this in history in that the church was protected from the murderous Sanhedrin who wanted to wipe out the apostles and the Christians, in the one hand, because the Sanhedrin lost their power base after 70 AD and then 130 AD. And also the, the church went underground. So you have this prudence of Sarah protecting her son Isaac and Rebecca protecting her son Jacob, one by sending the evil away, the other actually by sending the good away until it was time to return. And when God decides it was time for Jacob to return, he met him again in a dream reminded him of this first dream of the ladder that came to heaven. And in this dream of the multiplying flocks, which no one could stop, which is a sign of the Holy Spirit, no one can stop his fruitfulness. Every persecution against the church causes her to grow. He said, now go back and reconcile with your brother Esau. And Jacob was afraid. And he sent them ahead in droves, his family, and gifts to Esau to appease him. And I think this is kind of like the church trying to make embassies to the Jews. But we have to understand how to do that right, not exactly to avoid these errors of the Noahide covenant and the idea of universal fraternity, which, which are absolutely false. Let's talk um, about let's talk about the Noahide idea. Let's break that down because I don't think a lot of people know what that is. So Rabbi Jonathan Sachs gave a series of talks in 2012 about, I can't remember, a, a Jewish theology of the other or something about this. And he's trying to explain how you can have a, a dual covenant. It says in the Torah, we find a particular covenant and a universal covenant. The particular covenant is with Abraham. God called Abraham and pr promised him the land and his descendants to be multiplied the, like the stars in heaven or the sand on the seashore. And Rabbi Sachs says this is for the Jews. They are the chosen people, the called people. But with Noah, there was a universal covenant. And that's what's left over for the Gentiles. So you can have dual covenant. One is particular, one is universal. Um, but this this is false. And I, I, John, Rabbi Sachs, perhaps he's absolutely sincere. And he's trying to find a way 
to say to the Gentiles, don't feel miserable that you're not chosen. So he actually points to both Jacob and Esau and Ishmael and Isaac. Even he understands this is about Christians and Jews, but he gets it the wrong way around. For reasons I explained in the book, the younger brother represents Christ or the church. To go back to Noah, there, there can't be two covenants, the old covenant and the new. The, when we said the old covenant is abrogated, this is what Jesus meant when he said you can't put new wine in old wineskins, the old verses. And when he said you can't put new cloth on an old because the old will be ripped. The old covenant is gone. There's no point in sacrificing animals anymore in a temple that doesn't exist, on an altar that doesn't exist. Trying to rebuild it to cut the throats of lambs or find a red heifer to burn and sprinkle its ashes. This is insane. We cannot be washed from sin by the blood of animals. They never could. But the faith of the Jews and the Hebrews in that, God rewarded with grace to achieve what he promised. And then when Christ comes and washes us in his blood, it is actually efficacious. Ontologically, it works. So the how to understand the old and new covenant, we can understand again with brothers in the Torah as a baby before it's born and after it's born. It's the same baby. Right. When Nicodemus said to Jesus, can a man go back into his mother's womb? No. And that's why you can't have the old covenant anymore. It's gone. You've been born. And when you're born, you have all this light space. You meet loads of people. You get to know your mother and father. So with the new covenant, you have all this light of grace and understanding of the mysteries revealed. You have all this freedom of movement, um, which, which is grace strengthening our will. And you meet your brothers and sisters in Christ and you get to know your mother Mary of the church and God the Father. So th there cannot be a dual covenant, especially as the Torah has 613 commandments, most of which are do with the tabernacle and the temple, which are gone. It can't be you done. Can't follow those. They, some Jews try to say that our Lord Jesus Christ was a lawbreaker and that he broke the law of Moses. He did not. That is such a wicked slander. Even today, there's nothing Jesus did against the law of Moses. Nothing. When he picked the grains in the field and his apostles and ate them, that's not against the law of Moses. That's the law of men, the Pharisees, who the Pharisees have a noble zeal. But when they start creating man-made laws and imposing those on people, this isn't the law of Moses. Jesus said Moses spoke about him. And if you believe Moses, you'll believe me, which is true. So the, the old covenant is gone. And this attempt by Rabbi Sachs to say that we can have both the Abrahamic covenant for the chosen people, the Jews, and the Noahide covenant, which is more to do with natural law. Don't sodomize anybody, which is true. But that's not going to get us to heaven simply not violating natural law or will not get you to heaven you need the life of grace to be searching for god and um, he says the way we can hold this in in our heads is by abandoning or he says judaism doesn't recognize the principle of non-contradiction that's right so they have this house of shammai was it in house of hillel who asked uh, was it better that man was created or better if man had not been created because of sin and one said it would be better that we weren't ever created and one said no better than we created and then there was a voice from heaven said you're both right now you you can find is that, in the, is that in the talmud or something like that yeah yeah so you know what this you know what this is father it is it's like it's almost pantheistic i mean that sounds like pantheism it's it, it, well actually you know what it sounds like um i was just at at the canceled well sounds like gnosticism but i was just at the canceled priest conference and um uh, michael hitchborn he was reading he did a speech on um terre de chardin mm -hmm. and um the one line that the thing you know the spiritus mundi the spirit of the world says to terre de chardin in the desert is I'll, I'll either be saved with you or you'll be damned with me and it's like mm -hmm. it sounds like the same kind of spirituality yeah, it's a complete rejection of the truth of the cross. E. Michael Jones says, if you reject the Logos, who is Christ, then you're left with insanity. Yeah. So you earlier you said that the Novus Ordo has Jewish table prayers. Yeah. 
where did these come from? People think that the new mass was written to please the Protestants because you see Protestants using the Missal of Paul VI for their worship, especially Anglicans or perhaps some Lutherans would use it. It was done to please Protestants by removing the language of sacrifice and the priesthood and the real presence. Yep. Where does that come from? Jewish academics are writing today with pride, boasting how the Reformation was the result of Jewish work in the 16th, 17th century. That's the origin of Protestantism. A rejection of Mary, the mother of God, of the Holy Eucharist, of the Catholic priesthood, of the papacy. All these Protestant traits are have come from Judaism. So Martin Luther, for example, when he began, he was learning Hebrew from the Jews and their theology. And he actually turned furious against the Jews when they didn't follow him later on. He stupidly thought they would. But in his early years, he was formed by them, by their theology, by their thinking. This is where Protestantism comes from. That is why they misunderstand Zionism now in Israel. And they think that political Israel, geographical Israel, is somehow a fulfillment of the biblical prophecies about Israel. It isn't. We're meant to understand this spiritually. The church is the new Israel. And those who are baptized in Christ are those who have passed with Moses through the, the waters in the desert. The, the book of Tobit, for example, which St. Bede explains how that's about the conversion of the Jews, because the father was blind, but at mm. the end his son healed him. This is about the veil being removed from the hearts of the Jews. The, the Jews and the Protestants don't recognize That's right. Or Maccabees. And I was going to say...